Hello, hello, hello to everyone. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to this special edition of SMG Live. I'm your host, Sarah Bryant, and we have some really, really special things in store for you today. So we're exactly one week away from the next session of the SIFMA Foundation Sustainability Influencer Series. So next Thursday, April 8th at 11 a.m., we will continue to connect you with guests that are best equipped to inform, empower, and activate your understanding of the environment and its impact on the economy. Our next guest is filmmaker, explorer, and advocate Philippe Cousteau Jr., and Philippe is no stranger to environmental conservation and wildlife and water protection. And as you may have already experienced through one of his many award-winning shows, such as Going Green, Awesome Planet, now available and streaming on Hulu, by the way, or one of the countless others that have taken viewers along as he explores some of the most beautiful, historical, and sometimes even scary parts of our planet, Philippe's Commitment to solving global social and environmental problems extends beyond his own reach. His organization, Earth Echo International, functions to inspire young people to act now for a sustainable planet. And having a shared commitment to a sustainable future and equipping young people with the tools necessary to create the future that they want we at the SIFMA Foundation knew that he'd be the perfect person to advise us and you on best practices for social and environmental sustainability. So without further ado, I want to welcome Junior to SMG Live. So we're going to connect with him quite shortly. We're just waiting for him to come on. Hi, Philippe. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Good. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, thrilled to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you. We're so glad to have you very much. Where are you uh, calling in from? So for, for our viewers who would like to know. I'm in L.A. And You're in it's LA? a nice, lovely, lovely, cool morning here in Los Angeles. Uh, the home front. I'll, I'll be honest that I'm a little jealous about the cool. Um, and you don't understand cool. I'm freezing right now. I'm waiting for spring because I know you've had some awesome warm days. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah I think it's going to be in the, the 70s, maybe 70s, 80s today. So, you yeah, know, sorry. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> it's okay. You, you deserve it very much so. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. So one of the things that we'll be focusing on during our session next week is the blue economy. So for those who have never heard that term before and will be unsure about what that's about, how about you explain to us what's the blue economy? So the blue economy is basically anything that has to do with the economy and the ocean. So think about fisheries. That's part of the blue economy. Shipping, part of the blue economy. Mm -hmm. Tourism related to coastlines, the ocean, part of the blue economy. Um, energy, offshore yeah. wind, for example, is part of the blue economy. Um, uh, aquaculture or of, of fish or maybe seaweed or even less uh, maybe obvious things like new technologies that are looking at how to use algae to yes. create um, uh, biodegradable plastics. All of those things are part of the blue economy. Oh, wonderful. So all of that, you know, your work as, you know, a filmmaker and explorer touches on all of these different points, right? Um, so I wonder which of these um, seems to resonate the most with you personally and where you like to focus the, a lot of your attention. Well, in general, uh, you know, as environmental educators, ocean conservation advocates, um, we're looking to to really help people recognize how to build the sustainable blue economy mm -hmm. and get away from things like fossil fuels, uh, offshore drilling, et cetera, and towards things like renewable energy, like wind, for example, offshore wind. Um, wind blows more uh, uh, reliably and stronger on, on mm -hmm. the ocean because there's nothing to block it. So offshore wind is much more efficient than land-based wind power and um, can provide thousands of jobs. And that's the thing that we really think about when we look at environmental and particularly ocean conservation, is to remind people that it's not only about protecting coral reefs or whales, birds, whatever it may be, 
leveraging the ocean uh, sustainably is a wonderful way to build opportunity for people, to build jobs for people, and, and to remember that a healthy ocean regulates our climate. It provides the, the rainfall that feeds our crops, that feed our food, you know, feed our families. And so, um, you know, for us, it's really overall thinking about how we can be better to the ocean uh, so the better, so the ocean can be better to us. Right. Oh, I love that. So I, you know, you're talking about all the things that are happening underwater, right? This is an area that most of us do not think about on a day to day basis. <laughs> there are some of those, especially depending on where you're located. You, there are many people that we take for granted even having access to the ocean, right? And so to be able to learn more and to educate yourselves about what's available, what's happening, how we can create those sustainable futures and be mindful of ocean conservation and water conservation. What are some tools that anyone could use or find in order to find out more? Well, you know, it, again, it's, it's about building that sustainable future and also recognizing the sustainable future is key to our future, right? Mm -hmm. And no matter where you live, your life is touched by the ocean because, again, the ocean regulates our climate, provides trillions of dollars to the global economy every year. Um, in fact, if the ocean were a, a nation in terms of GDP, it would be the seventh largest in the world in terms of GDP. So wow. the ocean is a, is a massive contributor to, to jobs and opportunity for people around the world, to our economy, to our health, to our food, everything. Um, and so we encourage people, you know, at Earth Echo International, the nonprofit I run, we provide a lot of resources about the environment, about the ocean and conservation uh, to young people in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, and to families. So uh, that's a great place to go and check out. And also, uh, shameless plug, my wife and I just came out with a book called Oceans for Dummies for the Four Dummies yep. series. <laughs> First uh, book all about the ocean. And it is very thorough and fun and easy to read, but it is really designed to be the foundation of any beginning understanding. We talk about everything from the evolution of the ocean and life on mm -hmm. Earth to the blue economy, to exploration, to conservation, to all the different phyla of animals. I mean, everything you can imagine. Yeah. So that's a, that's a great primer and a great place to start. If you do want to learn more about the ocean, um, Oceans for Dummies is a good tool as well. Absolutely. I'll have to add Oceans for Dummies to my own personal list for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you mentioned with Earth Echo International, one of the things that you guys really focus on is bringing this attention to youth and really empowering youth to take these steps. So and even when you talk, and I've heard you in other interviews, you really engage young people and getting them started and making sure that they have the tools. So part of me wonders, like, why is it, you know, why do you focus so much on young people and ensuring that they have an understanding of what their contributions can be? Well, that's, that's one of the reasons we're so excited to be able to work with SIFMA is because our mutual, uh, you know, dedication towards education. You know, growing up, my grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, was a pioneer filmmaker and, and ocean explorer. 77 years ago, he co-invented scuba diving and really opened the world's eyes to the ocean. My father followed in his footsteps, making documentaries until his tragic uh, death just a few months before I was born in 1979. He... Um, but they, they inspired me, the film, the work, the, the books, all those things inf inspired me growing up. And so uh, I remember a, a piece of wisdom that, 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 uh, that I would read about my, from my father was, you know, before we talk about conservation, we have to talk about education. Mm -hmm. And education is vital if we're going to build a kind of social foundation in order to support sustainability, in order to support, um, uh, you know, a healthier planet and healthier people along with it. And so we started Earth Echo International 15 years ago and have now become a, a global force in environmental education, working with, over that time, over activating 2 million people around the world uh, in over 150 countries. And, um, and fundamentally, what we're seeing finally, I think, is, is a recognition that sustainability, again, is not just about trees and, and, and birds and coral reefs. It's about us. Exactly. We can't survive on this planet without a thriving ocean and a exactly. thriving environment. And, um, um, and embracing conservation can also provide opportunity. Again, I go back to that because that's so important. It can provide opportunity in how we feed our families and, and, and terrific jobs and sustainable jobs for people. Um, and that's what I think is really exciting and why in particular we're, we're really thrilled to be able to work with SIFMA on this. Same. So I, I think you said it perfectly. We definitely have a shared vision in wanting to ensure that, you know, young people of every age really feel are educated in their choices so that they can make more informed choices so that they can be more hands on in the work that they're doing. And I love that you mentioned uh, 
conservation, we have nothing with conservation if we don't have education. I think that's really, really powerful. And that reminds me that a number of the, the videos and even the shows and, and the explorations that you're doing, there's always a historical element for that place or for that location. And I wonder how how important is history and knowledge of the background of a location important when it comes to um, conservation? That's a really good question and an important question because the world has changed dramatically in the last few decades. For example, mm -hmm. when I was born 40 years ago in that time, and I have a two-year-old daughter, and when I look down at her, I think to myself, when I was her age, um, and, and the change that, hap that has happened since then, we've lost half the world's biodiversity. Now, that wow. may not seem like a big deal to some people. They think, wow. oh, fewer birds, fewer animals, fewer tigers, whatever. But all of the living creatures on this planet form this web of life that mm -hmm. supports everything else. And so, you know, for example, something that's been in the news a lot today or uh, these days is pollinators, bees, and their declining population because of pesticides and pollution. Um, well, those are the pollinators that do the work for us to pollinate our plants and our crops right. to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars of value every year to our, free for our, our national and global economy. And so without this rich web of biodiversity, we start to see a decline in the functions, the basic functions that the planet provides for us, like food, which is kind right. of important. I'm sure everyone would agree. And so, um, you know, without that historical understanding and context to see what we've lost, I think we lose the sense that we we run the risk of losing the sense of urgency that exists mm -hmm. in trying to prevent further decline in biodiversity in trying to stem the the, the 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 climate crisis and things like that and so you know for us it's really looking at, at at what things were like and this idea of shifting baselines that every successive generation their perspective of like what a healthy environment looked like mm -hmm. was when they were young uh, right. when in fact um you have to go back over 150 years in many cases to look at, at what a healthy environment could look like. And so um, that's, that's that context mm -hmm. is very, very important as part of the discussion to, to really elevate the urgency. I love that. And as a, as a little bit of a history buff myself, those are always my favorite parts <laughs> of the sessions. I love hearing about locations. I love hearing about the history of an environment, what it looks like, what it used to be. And I do agree. It, it incites that sense of urgency in you because some of these changes are so stark in, in a matter of years. So it, it, yeah. it definitely puts things into context in terms of how we need to be very, very vigilant in terms of the work that we're doing. And as you've mentioned so many times, the time to make change and to implement change is indeed right now. Um, well, you know, I, I love that you're a history buff. I studied history at university. I actually have a ah. master's in history. That's my formal training as a storyteller. Um, but one of the stories that we share in Oceans for Dummies is a research study that was done that looked at a, a day of sport fishing catch in the Florida Keys from the 1940s. And you see on, on this one pier, all these enormous fish. I mean, grouper and all these things that are like as big as the, the adults that are standing next to them. And there's got to be more than a dozen of them. And then what we did is, is we, we followed a research study that tracked photographs from the 50s, 60s, 80s, 90s into 2000s. And 2000, I think, 18 maybe was the last one that was taken. And what you notice is the fish get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. One day of, of so fish scary. catch. Now it's half a dozen fish that are maybe six or seven, maybe a foot long, as opposed to the multi, you know, 500 pound group of the people were catching dozens of them, you know, a hundred years ago, almost. And so our fifties, you know, about 70 years ago. And so again, from a historical perspective, the environment has changed dramatically and that's not good for us. And yeah. so having that, that kind of context is, is, uh, is really important. And on the flip side, why we focus so much on young people, as you pointed out, is um is in is historically the environmental movement in many ways has treated young people as the we we like to say that the hands and feet of the movement in other words mm -hmm. being the, the ones to go out and, and clean up beaches and and do you know the manual labor we really think of young people as the hearts and minds of the environmental right. movement and how much more right. sophisticated young people are now our work is around politics and around community engagement around you know a uh, uh, social entrepreneurship i know next week when we when we meet again for the presentation we'll be talking with victor yi one of our youth leaders um who's an extraordinary uh, uh, social entrepreneur, started businesses 
businesses to support the blue economy, support the environment. We've had other young people help pass legislation, even write legislation that has passed right. um, uh, clean and renewable energy uh, 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 laws in southern Florida, for example. We have young people in India, in Kenya, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Australia, in the UK that are doing extraordinary work that is really at the core of, of, of uplifting their communities, either you know, through politics, through the economy, through social entrepreneurship, through volunteerism, whatever it is. So, so that's what I'm excited about in particular is, is, is how much more sophisticated young people are today mm -hmm. in terms of how they apply solutions to these issues. It's, not, it's no longer only about doing beach cleanups and, and, and recycling. Yep. We've kind of trained ourselves to think that's about all that young people can do. They can mm -hmm. do so much more, and it's really exciting. Agreed. And with all the things that young people have had to endure over these last several years, they've seen more than a lot of us have seen in our entire lives in such a small span of time. And they've completely activated their commitment to doing the work. And as you mentioned, Absolutely. you know, it's bigger than the beach cleanups. And they are showing us that every single day. So kudos to all of the young people out there right now. We see what you are doing and you're inspiring us every day, truly. Um, Philippe, you mentioned a couple of times the term social entrepreneurship. So for those of us who may not be, who may not have heard that term before, what exactly does it mean to be a social entrepreneur? So when you think about entrepreneurship, of course, you know, it's, it's starting a business in, in essence, right? And so when we think about a social entrepreneur, it's someone that's looking at how they can start a business that can have a positive impact on society and the environment. Um, that's not always a given, right? We can create any kind of businesses that may create polluting, you know, items or may not have the best labor practices, may not treat their employees well. Um, and so a social entrepreneur looks at, at, at how do you create a business that can help people and the planet and make a profit because that's possible. Mm -hmm. And then you get mm -hmm. the best of all worlds. Other times it's called environmental, social and governance, ESG, you know, uh, businesses right. or investing. And, and you're starting to look at, 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 at large scale banks and Wall Street and, and other big companies and investment um, uh, uh, vehicles that are investing in these kinds of companies because they're recognizing, wow, if we can make money and save the world, what could be better than that? Right. <laughs> right. The two can go hand in hand. They don't have to be separate Absolutely. at all. Um, and you know, what we find is that in the long term, if they don't go hand in hand, that a lot of companies, um, you know, aren't as successful as they could be because their employees aren't happy. They're not working, you know, well. They're not working at peak efficiency. They have a lot of liabilities around the pollution. Maybe they're dropping in. I spent a lot of time covering the BP oil spill um, mm -hmm. in, in 2010, and BP still hasn't fully recovered from the damage to its reputation, and it's and it's a... Right. Uh, um, uh, underlying uh, um, uh, income that happened from a decade ago from from that disaster. So um, we find also that that oftentimes companies that take care of their their employees and the environment are also uh, the most successful. Agreed. And I think one of the things too, just you know, going back to young people and what they're doing and how they're activating their own voice and using their own voices when it comes to investing and in, in companies that they're interested in and how they are becoming more informed consumers, they are holding companies accountable, right? Absolutely. <laughs> That's so exciting. Yes. 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 You know, Bono uh, of U2, uh, you know, he, he has a great quote. He said, shopping is politics. Mm. And you're absolutely yep. right. How we shop, where we spend our money, all of that has tremendous power and influence in, in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the things that made us really focus on really pushing and, and elevating rather sustainability even within our own stock market game program. It's what made us like we want kids to get excited and also feel good about their investment choices. So when they have the opportunity to invest in a sustainable company, whether they did that knowingly and intentionally, or whether they were just making an investment choice and happened upon it, we want to make sure that they have the full understanding of what their investment choice really means and to be able to find yeah. out more information about that. So kudos Absolutely. to the young people. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. exactly a huge part of the power that they have and, and are exercising and it's really exciting. Yep. You've uh, continued the work of your father and your grandfather. You know, I have no doubt that it's obviously very deeply embedded in your life. Um, but I wonder, you know, have you ever thought about another, a different path? for yourself. You know, when I was little, I wanted to be a firefighter, but I think that, that almost every little boy goes through that phase. Uh, but that was about it. You know, again, growing up, reading my, 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 the books and, and watching all the films, my father and grandfather talking to my grandfather, cause mm -hmm. I didn't have an opportunity to know him. Um, 
they lived like real life Indiana Jones. I remember, you know, my first experience is traveling to Papua New Guinea in this remote islands, you know, days and days and days away from the nearest towns and hiking in the, the mountains and seeing these ancient abandoned caves with uh, human skulls scattered throughout them that were part of, you know, religious rituals for peoples that were long gone. Uh, I did. I felt like Indiana Jones. I'm 16 years old, hiking through jungles and seeing these skull caves. And I'm like, this is all real stuff. <laughs> Uh, and, and then diving for days and doing research and seeing things no one's ever filmed or seen before. Um, so I, I, uh, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. It's, it's really a, an extraordinary uh, experience. I love that. You've, you've had the ability to travel to some of the more far reaches of the world, right? And <laughs> see some beautiful and amazing places. Um, what's your favorite? Um, if one you could, of you, you know there's potentially several. have a favorite yeah it, that's a hard one I, I will say one of my favorite places on earth is um is the red sea mm. uh it's it's still one of the last remaining places to dive at least um that has healthy corals mm -hmm. um because the red sea has evolved over time as a, as a warmer saltier body of water than the rest of the ocean um, the corals there have evolved to, to tolerate warm water where everywhere else, as I'm sure people have seen in the news, you know, in the Great Barrier Reef, for example, Australia, you know, because of climate change, the ocean's warming and coral reefs are bleaching and dying. Yeah. Uh, that's not happening to the same degree in the Red Sea. So you can still find places that are, I tell you, if there's a Garden of Eden on Earth, it's a Red Sea coral reef. Okay. They're the most spectacular things you've ever seen. Oh, my goodness. Well, we'll just have to see it through your eyes for right now. <laughs> Which you don't mind. Well, unfortunately, we'll all be seeing it like on TV because I'm not going anywhere. I haven't been anywhere recently exactly. either. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So what are some ways um, that maybe young people can get involved with Earth Eco interna International? Well, one of the best things that, uh, that I want to encourage everyone to do, uh, today opens our new registration for our Water Challenge Ambassadors and our Youth Leadership Council. These are two youth leadership opportunities for young people between the ages of 14 and 22 uh, to apply. Our Youth Leadership Council is about 15 or so young leaders. It's a two-year program. We do uh, professional development, trainings. Um, young people have the opportunity to join events like Victor with me, mm -hmm. um, speaking in the past, lots of traveling, a little bit less now. We'll see how that goes over the next mm -hmm. two years. I'm sure we'll get back to it. Um, we do uh, we do all sorts of uh, leadership development opportunities, connect with other organizations, enter to all sorts of great stuff with our YLC. Our Water Challenge Ambassadors are a little bit more focused on particularly water quality and the global water crisis, which is one of the biggest problems we're facing in the world today. And again, we do a lot of training and facilitate work with them to organize projects in their communities uh, to really improve the quality of water in their communities um, and, and really help them help these young people become and, and, and enhance their leadership uh, on these issues, both national, you know, to, you know, locally in their communities, but then also give them a, a, an international platform to, to make connections and build relationships with people and other young people around the world. So um, the applications okay. for that open today at earthecho.org. Um, it's a competitive process, but I encourage all of you to, uh, to join and apply. Uh, it's really an extraordinary program. Oh, wonderful. And Philippe, I cannot thank you enough. You know, as much as I definitely appreciate and thank and the work that young people are doing every day is phenomenal. Our teachers are doing incredible work, but also thank you very much, not only for joining us, but for the work that you're doing every day. You know, you've really taken this, you, it emulates from you. Like this is hard work for you and you see that and you come across really dynamic, very informed, but you really have a love for this planet. Um, that is so real and radiates through you and is activated and seen throughout your work. So I want to thank you for even utilizing your own time, resources, and experience to, to help us be better, right? And to share your experiences with us and to really do your part to make this planet a lot better. So thank you for that very much. Well, it's always a pleasure. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted, you know, working with kindred spirits like yourself and all, the entire team at SIFMA um, is, is a delight. We're all in this together. And I would say the same. You all have dedicated your lives and your time. This is hard work. Yeah. It's not as easy to do. Um, thankless work sometimes, but, uh, but it's important work. Yep. And it inspires people every day. And I tell you, that's what gets me up in the morning and gets me excited about the day Thanks. is working with young people and seeing the passion and optimism on their faces. Um, and it's going to take all of us, a chorus of all of us, 
working together to make the world a better place. So I'm, I'm delighted to be in partnership with you all and, and looking forward to, the, to, to our event together. Thank you. I think that's a perfect way to, to close out and end off. You've been wonderful. And I could keep going on and on and on. But I want you guys to stay tuned and prepare for uh, the larger conversation that will happen a week from today at 11 a.m. via our webinar. So if you haven't had the opportunity to, please make sure that you register for the webinar. You can access it through our link in our bio. Philippe, thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you next week. I'm looking forward to it. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you in a week. See you in a week. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. So wasn't he great? So Philippe Cousteau is a remarkable, remarkable inspiration, and we are so grateful for his leadership, for his inspiration, and his work both in and outside of the organizational space. He is dynamic, and when you think of putting the work and when the rubber meets the road, he is definitely, definitely that. So as he mentioned, for those of you who are aged 15 to 22, you are invited to apply for a spot in Earth Echo's Youth Leadership Council. It's comprised of an international team, as he mentioned, of young environmental leaders who and young environmental leaders and selected Youth Leadership Council members will play a key role in leading Earth Echo's education programs, all while developing and implementing campaigns that will mobilize your peers worldwide to protect our water planet. So applications for the 2021 class is open through May 3rd. And for our younger environmentalists, don't worry, we didn't forget about you. You wanna check out Earth Echo's Our Echo Challenge. The Our Echo Challenge is a STEM competition that empowers US middle school students in grades five through nine to take a closer look at biodiversity in their communities. Open to apply through April 22nd, students will first identify threats to local ecosystems and then propose solutions to help preserve, protect, and repair those natural resources. So stock market game students specifically may already have a leg up here, as many of you are quite familiar already with identifying potential problems and developing long-term solutions to those problems from our National Invest Right essay competition. Critical thinking, problem solving, and applicable solutions are at the core of, the, of Invest Right. And we remain astounded year after year after year by stock market game student essay submissions. So if you haven't already submitted your essay, rest assured that it's not too late. So teachers, you can check out the details at investright.org. And the deadline is coming up on Wednesday, April 21st. So I cannot thank you all enough for tuning in today. And I look forward to having all of you join us for the full session next Thursday, April 8th at 11 a.m. As mentioned, the link to register for the webinar can be found in the link tree in our bio, or you can feel free to find out more information and reach out to us directly at smg at sifma.org for more information. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for your commitment to creating a sustainable planet. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Happy weekend.